Okay, this is the chapter on the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm gonna talk about how the electromagnetic spectrum is actually broken into seven different parts. And uh, that electromagnetic waves are both oscillations of electric and magnetic fields, and they're also made out of particles. So um, let's start out with uh, what the electromagnetic spectrum is, and then we'll go through each set of the seven parts. Now we're gonna start with the uh, longest of the wavelengths. We're gonna start with radio waves first. We have the longest wavelength, the lowest frequency. We'll go to microwaves, which are essentially just shorter wavelength radio waves. They are used in communication just like radio waves, but they tend to have a better bandwidth, a higher bandwidth. Infrared light is light that is too long for our eyes to see. Um, it acts more like vi the visible light that we can see. Ultraviolet light is wavelengths that are too short to see, frequencies that are too high. And then we talk about parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that have a very strong particle nature, X-rays and gamma rays. So that these are the seven parts um, of the spectrum. So let's go and talk about what's going on. Um, so first of all, what is an electromagnetic wave? Well, if we could visualize it, we would see it as this oscillating electric and magnetic field. Electric field and magnetic field are perpendicular to one another. Now, this was known before the 20th century. In the 20th century, we discovered, well, wait a minute. Not only does light act like a wave, electromagnetic wave, it also acts like a particle. And the way to resolve this or the way to sort of think about this is each photon, um, which is a particle of light, doesn't just act as an individual entity, okay? It has momentum, it has energy to it. It also acts like an oscillating field or sort of like a package of an oscillating field. So we can think of um, a big electromagnetic wave as being many, many photons superimposed on one another which are these packages of electric and magnetic fields. Again, it's a little bit hard to um, take some of the things that we see from the macroscopic world and apply them to the microscopic world. But um, it is true that not only do photons have a particle and wave nature, in fact, matter, matter on a very small scale also demonstrates a wave nature. So, Again, we sort of get into a little bit of this quantum weirdness when we get on to the very small scale. But you know, as I said, we have to visualize light as both a particle and as a wave. So here's the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's take a look at what is going on here. And we're going to see at the long, and of the spectrum where the wavelengths are longer. And remember waves have peaks and troughs and the distance between two peaks and the distance between two troughs, the distance that it repeats itself is the wavelength. So radio waves have the longest wavelength, you know, basically about a meter or longer. They can be in kilometers. Um, as we go to microwaves, they get shorter in wavelength and higher in frequency. Microwaves can be measured in centimeters. And we get to infrared light, the light just before what our eyes can perceive. And infrared light is typically measured in what we call microns. Visible light is measured in hundreds of nanometers. Um, ultraviolet light measured in, you know, tens of nanometers, you know, up to a couple hundred nanometers. X-rays even smaller than that, tens of nanometers and gamma rays, we get really, really small in terms of the wavelength. So looking at the spectrum, there's a huge variation of the size that these waves come in. You know, when we look at radio waves, again, they can be kilometers long, all right? Um, if we look at the gamma ray part of the spectrum, they can be as small as the nucleus of an atom, which is 10 to the negative 15 meters across. That is measured in femtometers. Of, Metric prefix that we don't come across very much is femto, which means 10 to the minus 15. 
So um, we were going to take a little tour and we're going to look at, you know, all these different um, you know, parts of the spectrum, starting with radio waves, going to microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays, and then finish up with gamma rays. All right. So once again, frequency and wavelength. Um, the wavelength is the distance that a wave takes to repeat itself. And the frequency is the number of oscillations per second. So as the wavelength gets shorter and shorter and these peaks get closer and closer together, because electromagnetic waves move at the speed of light, that means that the frequency is going to be higher. Now, again, each photon of electromagnetic radiation has energy and momentum. Um, but if we look at the energy, the energy is actually proportional to the frequency. So, you know, when we analyze what's going on with each part and we say, okay, you know, um, radio waves have the longest wavelength and the lowest frequency, they act very much like wavelengths and not really particles at all. There are particles there, there are photons of radio waves. However, there are just so many of them, they have so little energy individually that um, really the wave nature of this part of the spectrum is what we, 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 we see. Gamma rays, on the other hand, we talked about their wavelength and being measured in, in femtometers or in picometers. It's really, really small. We don't observe you know, phenomena that are in that small of a scale unless we can get down to the, the nucleus of the atom. So for the most part, gamma rays have such a short wavelength, such a high frequency, that they act more like individual particles. Each particle has quite a bit of energy itself. Um, so, you know, again, looking at the different parts of the spectrum, um, we can, you know, again, you know, say that, oh, and the gamma rays, these are more particle-like, and the radio waves, these are more wave-like. And what we can see, the visible spectrum, sort of right in between. Okay, let's talk about the lowest frequency waves, radio waves and microwaves. Very strong wave nature. We don't really talk about their particle nature. We don't talk about them as photons. We'll get to those with the higher frequency waves like X-rays and gamma rays, which have a strong particle nature. So radio waves, um, are basically, uh, you know, as we said, at the very end of the spectrum, if you will. Um, here, we say that the uh, radio waves have a frequency of 300 megahertz or lower. And that sounds like a huge number, 300 mega, 300 million oscillations per second. But in the scheme of things, that's really a very, very low frequency. And that means that their wavelength is gonna be greater than a meter. Okay, so we're pretty familiar with radio waves and how they're used in communication, all right? Um, when we look at radio waves um, as the lowest frequency electromagnetic waves, um, they are easy to produce with small oscillating currents and easy to convert back into information using some type of receiver. Okay, now the radio wave part of the spectrum, I'm not gonna go into each part of it. Um, in the United States, we break it up into different sections. And in actuality, it ends at VHF, even though uh, by, our, by our definitions, um, the microwave part of the spectrum is also classified sort of the same way. So we have very low frequencies um, at this end, low frequency in the hundreds of kilohertz, medium frequency in the, the, around the megahertz range, high frequency HF at 10 megahertz, VHF at 100 megahertz. And remember, we define the radio spectrum as ending at 300 megahertz. However, by some definitions, it actually goes beyond this. So um, again, our government will break different radio frequencies up for communications and navigation purposes. And um, AM and FM broadcasts were sort of the first big, widely available broadcasts available. 
And again, if you want to go into all the details, we can see that uh, VLF, um, very low frequencies, actually used uh, by the military to uh, communicate with subs because these long wavelengths could actually penetrate the ocean surface. Um, standard uh, broadcasting antennas for, for uh, radio clocks. If you've ever bought one of those clocks that says atomic you know, clock, what you're buying is not an atomic clock. An atomic clock would basically take up an entire room. You're basically buying a clock that gets a signal from the government where uh, it sync these clocks with an atomic clock, usually at the National Institute for Standards and Technologies. So again, very low frequencies. It's used by the military. Not much application that we see um, in everyday life. Low frequency, you know, um, it is usually used to carry a time uh, signal. Uh, medium frequency was the original AM radio. This is the first, you know, big commercial um, band that was uh, used. It's still used today. Um, there's still AM stations that are, are active. A uh, high frequency, this was used by what we call home amateur uh, radio. So uh, a little bit above the AM. Um, at VHF, very high frequency, this is where um, you know, FM stations still are being broadcast and where television stations used to be broadcast before all of the digital television was moved up to UHF. So really VHF is where uh, we say radio waves and if you go higher than VHF, um, you get into uh, the microwave part of the spectrum. Uh, what's interesting is that the term radio telescope actually includes uh, parts of both the radio part of the spectrum, okay? We can get, um, you know, wavelengths that are between about one and 10 meters um, in the radio spectrum that'll penetrate the atmosphere. But radio telescopes also operate in what we oftentimes consider the microwave part of the spectrum. Um, you know, down to a few centimeters. So uh, when you see a radio telescope, it's operating in a part of the atmosphere. There's only you know, two parts of the atmosphere where all, you know, most of the radiation makes it down to the surface. All the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum is blocked by our atmosphere. That is in the radio slash microwave part of the spectrum and the visible spectrum, because obviously we can see the sun if we couldn't see visible light, the sun would be blocked by the atmosphere. Okay. So, radio waves are used in astronomy to see things that we don't necessarily see in the visible part of the spectrum. And before the advent of orbiting satellites, um, this was the only way to see things that weren't in the visible spectrum by building these big radio dishes. And we're able to see um, you know, different things that aren't visible in uh, you know, the optical part of the spectrum. Basically a radio telescope is a big um, reflector telescope, uh, but because the waves are so big, it's hard to make an image with them. So uh, astronomers actually use a, a, a trick where they'll put many radio telescopes together in an array. And this will allow them to see uh, much greater detail because the array of telescopes actually has like one big telescope. So that's radio waves. They're used primarily for communication. And we're going to see the same thing with microwaves. Um, I just like to think of microwaves as just higher frequency radio waves. They still have a very strong um, wave-like uh, you know, property. Uh, the main difference is microwaves, because their wavelength is smaller, are actually easier to beam. And we'll see why that's important. Now, here's some applications for microwaves. Obviously, the microwave oven is a big application for microwaves. Um, the water molecules have a resonance where if we expose them to an oscillating microwave field uh, in the gigahertz range, the water molecules will vibrate strongly and heat up. But of course, microwaves also have applications in radar. One thing that is difficult to do with radio waves 
is to focus them into a beam. And we can do that with microwaves. And that actually allows us to send a beam of microwaves to um, not only tra track air traffic, but also to bounce off of raindrops. Um, again, ultra high frequencies, what we call uh, UHF is used in a number of different things. It's used in uh, cell phones. Um, it's used in digital television. If um, you get your uh, television signal broadcast, you're getting it through a digital signal, which is sent over microwaves. But again, uh, microwaves are great because um, they uh, can be beamed. So uh, they're, they're useful in um, you know, cordless tele telephones. Of, um, but the problem with microwaves is they can also be uh, very readily absorbed by water molecules. So that's sort of a down part of it. Cell phones use microwaves mainly in the part of the spectrum that's not heavily absorbed by, by uh, water. But uh, during a rainstorm, sometimes in remote locations, you can notice that the service becomes worse as a microwave signal is absorbed. Um, satellite radio uses um, microwaves, even though it says it's satellite radio, it's actually um, using microwave beams that are coming down from satellites. And um, again, you know, cell phones, um, yeah, cell phones, uh, microwave, um, <clears throat> yeah, cell, cell phones and in, in, in radar use uh, microwaves. Uh, here's super high frequency, sorry about that. Um, unlike this, the UHF, the super high frequency is actually absorbed easier, but um, it's used in aviation radar, um, it's used in traffic radar, um, it doesn't have to necessarily uh, go as, as, as easily through the air because uh, usually uh, the beam is pretty strong. And um, this is how they not only can uh, locate where rain is, where aircraft are, but using the Doppler effect where higher frequencies are produced as something is approaching us, you can actually determine the speed of something. And again, weather radar is one of the most useful aspects of microwaves. Not only do microwaves uh, at high intensities heat up water, they're also scattered by water. So that makes um, microwaves very, very useful for uh, tracking weather. And here's what the inside of a radar dish looks like. Um, you know, these, <laughs> these uh, spheres right here actually have a dish that'll rotate and keep track of, of the weather. Cable television, believe it or not, a microwave signal is actually sent over what's called a coaxial cable. And this is analogous to a fiber optic that the uh, electromagnetic waves are trapped within the cable, therefore it can propagate a very long distance. Now, most cable television, uh, the, ca the coaxial cable is being replaced by more and more uh, fiber optic, um, but uh, you know, still, you are, are getting, um, unless you're getting, you know, some type of, uh, you know, fiber right to your house, you're still probably getting signals uh, via coax. Uh, the reason why they switched to fiber optics is because fiber optics uses infrared light, which has a higher bandwidth, and you can send more information. With them. Satellite television, same thing, a microwave beam is sent from an orbiting uh, satellite. Uh, it's a little bit different from satellite radio. Satellite radio has three geosynchronous satellites that sort of trade off their position over the United States, whereas um, a single uh, satellite operated by Hughes beams a television signal to uh, Dish Network and um, DirecTV uh, customers. So all beaming by um, microwaves. And if you have Wi-Fi, you know that um, higher end Wi-Fi routers can actually beam uh, their signal to whatever location you want to send it to. So uh, when you go out and you buy a router, it'll say, you know, able to beam. And when you see all these different antennas on it, that is actually using interference to send the signal in one particular location uh, where you might have a computer, you might have a cell phone or, or a tablet or something. 
Um, higher the frequency, the higher the bandwidth, gigahertz um, or gigabit uh, Wi-Fi is, is great for streaming movies. One of the problems is as we get to higher and higher frequencies, um, it doesn't make it through the air very, very far. So in your home, uh, gigabit um, wireless is great, but over a longer distance, it, it's uh, problematic. And again, microwaves are used in astronomy. The cosmic background radiation, which is the signal from the original Big Bang, is actually a uh, big microwave signal. Um, and it comes from all directions of space because at one point the universe is all at one small location. So we get from the two longest wavelengths, radio waves and microwaves. And now we're gonna get into infrared where the waves are getting small enough, where the energies are getting high enough per photon, where it begins to act a little more like visible light. So regular optics or optical properties are going to begin to uh, kick in uh, for infrared light where infrared light, again, won't be acting as much like a wave. Well, it'll still be acting like a wave, but um, it's easier to focus even more than we're able to do with uh, microwaves. And uh, we do see refraction and reflection with infrared light, something we'll talk about more when we get to visible light. So infrared light starts at about 300 gigahertz, very large number. That's about a third of a trillion oscillations per second. And it goes up to about 385 trillion hertz. I'm, I'm sorry, terahertz. It's not trillion hertz, terahertz. And um, that is just at the edge of where the eye can perceive light. So this gives it a wavelength of anywhere from 780 nanometers. That's where red light begins, down to about one millimeter where microwaves begin. So you can see some near infrared uh, with your eye at very high intensities. Um, and whereas near infrared acts more like visible light, far infrared acts more like microwaves. Okay, infrared light, what are some of the applications? Well, infrared light can be used for night vision. It can be used for thermal imaging. And believe it or not, fiber optics do not use visible light. They use infrared light because infrared light, where which is very close to the visible part of the spectrum, acts more, is, is more transparent uh, for glass, or I should say glass is more transparent to the infrared light. Um, so here we can see different parts of the infrared spectrum. Um, we'll start from the bottom. Far infrared acts more like um, microwaves in many way, or at least short microwaves. Long infrared we might uh, see in uh, thermal imaging, okay? Uh, mid infrared uh, is usually given off by hotter objects than um, you know, room temperature objects and, and body temperature objects. So it's actually used in guided missile technology. Short wavelength IR um, is very, strongly absorbed by water, but um, is actually where we, what we use for uh, fiber optics. And then near infrared is um, basically uh, used for uh, night vision. Although, you know, we're, we're right at the edge of where it's used in fiber optics too. So um, let's look at some of these in detail. So, um, here is an infrared view in the far infrared of the constellation Orion. And we see these uh, cold uh, molecular clouds from which stars form. Um, thermal imaging comes from um, you know, long wavelength IR. And um, here is uh, an actual image of a human body. Here's an image of a house. And you can see that um, the different colors that are used, these are uh, computer generated, the different colors that are used represent different intensities of, of infrared indicating higher or lower temperatures, blue being cooler, red being uh, warmer. So um, mid-infrared, as we said, um, hotter objects 
low at even shorter wavelengths. So mid-infrared is used by the military, um, unfortunately, to uh, take down enemy aircraft. And we can easily see how a uh, commercial jet, um, its hot engine exhaust gives a very strong thermal signature. Um, to counteract these me measures, uh, many aircraft in the military actually exhaust their, um, their jets uh, on the top surface. So um, it's harder for these missiles to track them down. And they also use countermeasures like uh, giving off flares. Here you have, I think it's an F-15, uh, releasing flares to uh, um, you know, simulate uh, a um, diversion against one of these um, missiles. Short wavelength IR, uh, from about 1.3 micrometers to uh, three microns or micrometers is used primarily in fiber optics. Um, we use fiber optics because here you see uh, a logarithmic scale, which means that as we go up, you know, we look at uh, different parts here. As we go up, each of these represents a power of 10. So down here, where uh, we've got this tip here and we've got this tip here, um, we're under one decibel per kilometer. If we sent this instead by visible light, it would attenuate by a factor of 10 faster, which means you'd lose your signal 10 times faster and it'd be difficult to get it uh, from one end of the fiber to the other. So that's why we use infrared. It's just better in terms of sending uh, a signal much further where glass doesn't absorb um, the signal as much. Uh, and again, near infrared, right before we can see it, is very helpful for another application, and that's night vision. Night vision is uh, very key for uh, search and rescue and also for military. Um, so near infrared uses uh, um, 800 nanometers. Um, and longer in order to, to see uh, what's normally not visible to the human eye. Speaking of which, we're now to the middle part of the spectrum. We're now to the visible light that we can see. Now, the next chapter will go over this in much more detail, but um, this part of the spectrum is uh, basically the, the most narrow. It goes from 385 terahertz 770 terahertz. That means its wavelength is 390 nanometers up to about 780 nanometers. We typically say that visible light is somewhere around a half a micron, a half a, uh, a million, a half a millionth of a meter, okay, or a half of a thousandth of a millimeter in wavelength. Higher frequencies of light beyond visible cannot be seen once we get into the UV. They're not transmitted well through our cornea and lens of our eye. But again, visible light um, consists of all the colors of the spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And again, we'll go into more detail of the visible spectrum when we talk about light. Um, we do break the visible spectrum into its own parts and they're, they're not really equal in, in size. Um, here we can you know, see that uh, the longest wavelength right where infrared stops is red. That's actually the, the, the largest spread of wavelengths from 780 nanometers to 622. Orange and yellow are some of the narrowest bands, okay? Uh, green's a little bit bigger and blue and violet are a little bit bigger. But um, I think when we were kids, we were always taught Roy G. Biv, uh, there is no I, there's no indigo. Um, again, the official colors are the six that are shown here. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Okay. Um, ultraviolet light. Now this is important. This is where we're beginning to get very high energy photons. So the energy of the photons is now high enough 
to actually rip electrons off of some atoms. So anything from ultraviolet to X-rays to gamma rays is going to be ionizing radiation and can cause cancer as a result. So ultraviolet light, uh, shorter in wavelength than visible, slightly longer than um, X-rays, and it pretty much starts at about 10 nanometers on the edge of the X-ray part of the spectrum. and goes right up to purple light or, or violet light. Now, ultraviolet light can be broken into uh, a number of different um, parts. Um, as we can see here, there's UV, A, B, and C. These are all related to sunburn and skin cancer. Uh, there's near ultraviolet light, middle ultraviolet light, far ultraviolet light, and extreme ultraviolet light. And we'll be talking about the importance of each of these also. It is extreme ultraviolet light, which is being used to manufacture the smallest of all chips. Now, notice here, UVA actually falls in near ultraviolet light. UVB sort of spans between near and middle ultraviolet. And UVC is sort of at far ultraviolet. So um, classifying it UVA, B, and C um, is one way of putting it. Um, if you want to do it as near, middle, far, and extreme ultraviolet, um, you can classify it that way too. Okay, uh, UVA, UVB, UVC. Why do we care? Well, typically when we classify ultraviolet as UVA, UVB, or UVC, we're classifying the ultraviolet light according to how it can cause damage to our skin. Now, 95% of all the UV that makes it to the surface of the earth is UVA. Um, that's because that frequency is not strongly absorbed by the ozone or is not absorbed as much as the other frequencies. You know, remember the Atmosphere is transparent to uh, visible light, and violet is part of that. As we get into UV, the ozone starts absorbing some of that. So um, UVA is the first, uh, the nearest ultraviolet that can make it through. And uh, UVB doesn't quite get through as much. Only about 5% of all the ultraviolet that you're exposed to becomes UVB. Now, UVA is very dangerous. It penetrates deep into the skin and cause skin cancer, but also too much exposure creates premature aging of the skin. Now, some people love to get a tan and they think, oh, this is uh, great for, for uh, you know, my look, or you know, this is gonna make me you know, look healthier. But the truth of the matter is that um, if you are getting a suntan, that is actually your body's defense uh, because you've burned your skin. So um, very important that we're finding out now that a suntan is not a healthy thing, uh, especially for fair skinned people. You know, the less melanin that you have in your skin, the more susceptible you are to damage to your skin and skin cancer. Um, that melanin is actually very protective. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm as pale as a ghost, so I don't have very much protection. So I tend not to go out into the uh, into uh, bright sunlight. I tend to wear a sunscreen when uh, I need to. So um, UVB um, is less penetrating, uh, but um, it uh, does cause uh, you know, sunburns as we talked about. And um, it is most intense in, in the middle part of the day. So uh, UVB, UVA, we've gotta be very, very careful about our exposure uh, to these wavelengths. And again, um, if it weren't for the ozone layer in the stratosphere, all life on earth would be pretty much wiped out. That's because the next part of the uh, UV spectrum is UVC, which is deadly. Um, UVC uh, would basically destroy all plant life um, if, it, if we were to lose the ozone layer. And uh, for a long time, we were seeing big holes in the ozone layer an increase in skin cancer due to the fact that chlorofluorocarbons used in refrigerants were actually releasing free chlorine, which would destroy the ozone layer. The ozone layer is naturally produced by uh, lightning, by the way, by discharges, but takes a long time to uh, repair itself. Ultraviolet exposure, again, 
ultraviolet only makes its way into the skin. So we've got to be very, very careful. Um, your UV exposure depends on your, your altitude. Closer to sea level, the UV light has to go through more atmosphere, but it also depends on the time of day and your latitude. Yeah, you're told, oh, don't go out in the sun um, between you know, uh, 10 a.m. And, and 2 p.m. Uh, so that you limit your exposure. And you can see here that right around 10 a.m. and um, oh, it should be actually later, uh, 4 p.m., uh, we actually get uh, the most intense part of the, uh, the sunlight. So um, 10 to four is uh, when you really have to be careful and uh, make sure that you use uh, sunscreen. And here's a chart and we can see that uh, not only does our UV um, exposure depend on the time of day, uh, it depends on the time of the year, you know, in the winter time at this latitude, the sun doesn't get as high, but it also depends on your latitude, okay? Uh, the further north we are, the lower the sun is in the sky and therefore the less exposure we get. As you go further south, the exposure gets more and more. And again, um, UV index is an indication of how dangerous the sun is. Um, Usually, when the index is between zero and two, it's really not um, a factor. Um, between uh, three and five, you know, you got to take some precautions. But as soon as it gets above six, we are doing uh, damage to our skin, and we've got to be careful, especially uh, for fair complexions. What's interesting is that uh, ultraviolet light. Um, is uh, used by flowers to uh, secretly signal uh, certain insects. Here you can see how uh, a sunflower appears in the visible part of the spectrum and sunflowers are yellow. Here's how it would appear, this is colorized in um, the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. You can see there's a little encoded message right here. Um, the uh, petals are darker toward the center and lighter on the side, which is uh, used to encourage uh, preferred insects to uh, pollinate the flower. Okay, let's go forward. Uh, middle ultraviolet light can be produced very easily with mercury vapor lamps. Um, now, normally glass would block the middle ultraviolet, but if you put the vapor in uh, fused silica instead, which uh, we sometimes call quartz, these low pressure mercury vapor lamps produce uh, UVC in very, very high quantities. This is a very powerful germicidal um, tool. Now remember I said if the ozone layer went away, it would kill all plant life because UVC would uh, destroy the uh, cells which are used to convert the sunlight into chemical energy. Um, but if we use these things in uh, heating and cooling ducts and other places that we want to sterilize, it'll also destroy bacteria. So these UV lights are oftentimes used for that very purpose. Far ultraviolet light is used to manufacture uh, very, very small transistors. Photolithography, which produces the transistors, we can only produce a transistor as small as the wavelength of light. Um, if we used visible light, then you know, probably the transistors that we create could only be you know, perhaps about a micron or so, okay? Uh, in today's world, that's really too large. We need smaller transistors because smaller transistors are faster and we're able to put more transistors on a single chip. It corresponds to a fat, you know, a higher, um, processing rate, more memory, more everything. So there's been a real push to go deeper and deeper into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And most chips um, use far ultraviolet light, but you've probably noticed recently there's been a chip shortage for all but um, for all of the uh, very uh, small um, transistor uh, chips. Um, there's really only one place in the world 
that uh, produces these in mass quantities. And uh, this is a, a company in uh, Taiwan. So uh, what's happening now is there's a real push to um, get these, uh, these chip forges up and running in the United States too that are capable of producing these very, very small transistors because you know, as we get smaller and smaller, okay, if you're producing most of your chips in the far ultraviolet, you're producing bigger transistors, which are slower, produce more heat, and um, obviously can't store as much information. Um, extreme ultraviolet light might be as far as we can go down uh, with these chips. If we go any smaller, we're starting to get on the atomic scale. And what happens is even things like thermal vibrations can cause the transistors to not operate properly. So uh, in the future, if we wanna go faster, we may have to uh, think of other things other than silicon. And again, here's a picture of the earth and the ozone hole. These ozone holes happen typically in the colder uh, times of the year and free chlorine from uh, chlorofluorocarbons have been a big uh, ozone hole creator. Uh, the chlorine breaks ozone, which is three oxygens bonded together into a diatomic oxygen, which doesn't absorb ultraviolet light. So by, the, by using different refrigerants today and, and banning chlorofluorocarbons, we've been able to at least allow the ozone layer to repair itself a little bit. Ultraviolet light allows us to see very, very high temperatures in astronomy. The problem is ultraviolet light doesn't really penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. So this image that we see right here was taken by um, the SOHO uh, spacecraft, which is in orbit around the Earth. Now we're getting to even shorter wavelengths. And when we talk about shorter wavelengths, we're talking about more energy per photon. At even shorter frequencies, we get to the X-rays. Now, normally X-rays, um, medical X-rays that we get are really not at high enough intensities to uh, be a problem with cancer. Now I said, you know, you wanna protect yourself from ultraviolet light in the sun because that'll damage your skin, that'll damage the genetic material in your skin. This can lead to skin cancer. However, your body naturally has the ability to repair small amounts of damage. It's when we get very large amounts of damage uh, where we get exposed to large amounts of ionizing radiation. That's what we have to worry about. In fact, your body's always being exposed to natural gamma radiation uh, from um, decaying isotopes in, in the earth. It's always been that way. We've always been exposed to radiation and our bodies are perfectly equipped to uh, handle that. It's when we get very, very intense exposures to X-ray that we have to be worried that, well, if we start getting more than the natural background radiation, we increase our risk of cancer. Now, most X-rays have so little ionizing radiation, it's less than when you receive a day from either the earth or from cosmic radiation, okay? But high intensity um, X-rays like CAT scans, you have to be somewhat limiting there because if you're getting multiple CAT scans, you're starting to exceed what our body naturally would get from the ordinary environment. To produce X-rays, we accelerate electrons into metal targets. Usually it's a very hard metal called tungsten. Tungsten is also used in the filament of light bulbs. And we can think of the X-ray machine as being like a big light, okay? It um, produces the X-rays and then shines them through our body. And then film on the other side uh, is uh, basically exposed and our body produces a shadow. And because our bones have a lot of calcium, they're very good at um, of, uh, absorbing the X-rays and not producing an image or I should say producing an image. Um, an X-ray that you typically get at the dentist, an X-ray that you typically get um, for medical purposes, uh, your X-ray is actually negative. So wherever it was exposed to X-rays, it'll be dark. And wherever it was not exposed to X-rays, uh, 
it'll be light or transparent. So, and again, um, X-rays are produced by uh, you know, slamming uh, these electrons into tungsten, um, usually produces two peaks uh, associated with uh, inner electrons. What happens is the electrons come in at such great speed. They hit the metal atoms, but they strip off the inner electrons. And when outer electrons fall to replace them, they give off a very, very high frequency photon. And that's what produces the X-rays. We can skip some of this, a um, little bit beyond you know, the detail we want to go into. But uh, uh, there are two types of X-rays, characteristic X-rays, which are produced by the inner electrons of the metal and Bremsstrahlung radiation, which is where electrons will slow down and accelerate as they get very close to the atom. X-rays can be used to identify the structure of things like crystals. Um, diffraction of X-rays really allowed us to see how atoms were arranged in crystals very, very early on. Um, it also led to the uh, discovery of the double helix uh, structure of, um, of uh, DNA. And uh, there's an interesting story about that. Uh, two men received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the double helix, when in fact a woman actually um, did the hard work. She prepared the uh, crystal of DNA uh, for the study and uh, should have shared the Nobel Prize, but she didn't. But uh, that's the way things were. You know, science is uh, finally be co coming out of its uh, more sexist um, you know, period where uh, men were given credit and, and women were uh, denied credit. Uh, soft X-rays are X-rays that tend to be closer to the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Uh, soft X-rays are actually um, being used to image uh, very, very small objects. When you use a visible microscope, you're limited by the wavelength of light. So usual microscopes that we have in the, the lab, they can only see structures, you know, probably down to about a micron. That's about the resolution that you're gonna get. Still very good, still a thousandth of a millimeter, much smaller than what your eye can see without any help. But when we wanna see smaller things, we tend to have to use something called an electron microscope, which uses electrons as waves. The problem is electrons don't travel through a vacuum and therefore to see something, we need to prepare the sample, freeze dry it, and then put it in uh, an electron microscope. Using soft x-rays is very difficult because they don't work with lenses. We've got to use mirrors to actually focus the image, but we can use it just like a traditional microscope. And here you can see um, malaria uh, parasites that are infecting a red blood cell. And um, you'd never be able to see this with a visible microscope. Here we have the resolution at 2.4 nanometers uh, about 200 times better resolution than an invisible um, microscope. Um, hard X-rays are um, more penetrating. We use them for medical uh, imaging and we use them, you know, the TSA uh, or TSC uh, uses them to uh, detect, uh, um, you know, contraband in uh, carry on luggage and in, in other luggage. X-rays in astronomy are used to observe the uh, hottest, so the hottest phenomena such as the uh, solar corona, um, supernova remnants and even black holes. Last, but certainly not least are gamma rays. Gamma rays are the shortest of all electromagnetic waves, and gamma rays come from the nucleus of the atom. They come from radioactive nuclei that are unstable and decay. Now, here's a picture of Chernobyl, and one of the problems with the Chernobyl disaster is it spread radioactive material all over the place. One of the most dangerous types of radiation that were given off uh, from these radio, 
isotopes was gamma rays. And um, gamma rays uh, are given off when a nucleus starts from a higher energy state and falls to a lower energy state. Um, this usually happens when one element um, decays into another element. So for instance, boron 12 is unstable. It will decay into carbon 12, which is stable, but it'll decay into a higher energy state where the nucleus has extra energy. It gives off that extra energy as a gamma ray. And this gamma ray is very, very penetrating. Um, gamma ray typically follows the decay of a parent isotope into a daughter isotope. And um, unlike other forms of ionizing radiation, like alpha and beta particles, which are helium and nuclei and electrons, gamma rays can penetrate through a lot of stuff. So um, if you have um, radioactive material that gives off alpha particles, those are really not dangerous unless you uh, ingest it or you inhale it. Uh, radon does decay into radioactive bismuth that gives off alpha particles. And that's why radon is so dangerous in the home. But for the most part, alpha and beta particles can be uh, blocked. Alpha particles are blocked by a piece of paper. Beta particles are blocked by uh, you know, thin aluminum foil. But you need a thick lead wall or concrete wall to uh, block uh, alpha particles, okay? So again, um, gamma rays are probably the most dangerous of uh, electromagnetic waves. Um, they're very penetrating. They'll go right into your body very, very easily. And um, they're very difficult to stop, not easy to block them. You know, sunscreen can block ultraviolet light. Um, you know, Lead and you know, thin layers of lead, you know, concrete can block x-rays, but gamma rays are very, very penetrating. Okay, that's it for the electromagnetic spectrum. But again, remember that um, radio waves have the longest wavelength. They have the lowest energy per photon, the lowest frequency. Gamma rays, on the other hand, have the highest frequency, highest energy per photon, and the shortest wavelength. And of course, there's seven parts.